Good morning, people. Today we have a what I can safely say is a topical issue, and one which our speaker feels very strongly at. Um, that, that, uh, today we have our friend David Moat, who his title of his piece is Peace, Work and Justice in the Context of Gaza. David. Uh, thank you, Ray. Um, I'm actually going to take a, a step back from talking about Gaza, but I'm going to talk about the tension between working for justice as I as I experience it. I'm not I'm not um, pontificating in general about what I think is generally true. I'm just talking about my experience. Uh, so the tension that I feel between justice work and um, reconciliation work. Um, because I, I feel the tension between these two things um, keenly. And particularly, I'm going to talk about something called a reconciliation laboratory, which is coming up on the 12th of February. Um, I'll say that I, I've got three little words of introduction. I've just um, come away from serving my bacon butty breakfast, which I do on a Friday morning in a local sheltered housing scheme. The community policeman called Silas often pops in. He's a refugee from Burundi years ago. And he was writing something down and it, it's a piece of for him of critical reflection. So he was saying, I can't make any progress in my work as a policeman if I don't critically reflect on my practice, on, on what it is I've done wrong and what I can do better. That's one thought. I chatted to a guy called Ray, um, not this Ray, another Ray, um, who's ex-Catholic. He's about 80 years old and he hangs out with um, young people who are kind of new age seekers. And he says that we are spiritual beings trying to live a human life, not human beings trying to live a spiritual life. We're kind of encased in, in a human frame. Um, and doubt is a necessary part of our spiritual journey. He used the image of a ladder this morning. We're climbing a ladder, and whilst we got both our legs on a rung of the ladder and both our hands on the side of the ladder, we feel safe. But of course, we're not going forwards. Going forwards entail it entails lifting one of our feet in, into the unknown um, will the next rung hold our weight will we find it uh, with our feet so uncertainty and doubt are necessary parts of a, a spiritual and to me that's a critical part of a reconciliation laboratory so that you've got the Im image of the ladder. And the third um, image I want to leave you with as an introduction um, is, comes from another refugee. He's, uh, his name is uh, Ozyan. He's from Turkey. He has Turkish mother and a Kurdish father. And he's uh, a member of the Alevi religion or sect, which is um, a kind of Shia sect. And the Alevis have been persecuted um, by other Muslims for centuries. And uh, he, he showed me um, an image of Sisyphus pushing a stone up the mountain. We, as we know from the Greek legend, it's a kind of curse that the gods inflict on Sisyphus. He has to push up the rock and then it's uh, inev inevitably when he gets to the triumphant summit, it rolls all the way down the hill again. He has to start again. 
And he says, the Alevi, in this um, story or image, the Alevi spiritual journey is about finding bliss, peace in the, in the work of Sisyphus, learning to love the place you're in without ha hatred and bitterness and despair. So um, those are the three bits of introduction. Then for me, the um, existential thing is that I spend a lot of my time as an advocate for Palestinian rights. I look up what's happening in Gaza. I fill my head with you know, knowledge of what's happening. Um, I take sides. Um, I, I think what I'm doing is part of resistance. It's part of solidarity. It involves strong feelings, sometimes powerful and euphoric, like being on the march last Saturday in London when uh, I was playing trumpet with a samba band and the marchers loved it. And for a, for a minute, we felt significant and powerful and we were making a difference. Uh, other times I feel uh, in, in despair because uh, Israel and America carry on regardless. Um, and I have other feelings of, of cynicism, of um, anger, um, bitterness. Um, so that's a world that an emotional world that I I live in a lot. And then I, I live in another world um, which has more serenity, which has more trust, more letting go. Um, and I find moving from one to the other very, very difficult. Um, I think moving to the world of conciliation uh, which is a, a more inclusive place is uh, I, I feel fear I feel fear of being misunderstood of being rejected uh, of or of being uh, found out for the partisan um, less than fully loving creature that I really am um, maybe found out for being um, anti-Semitic when I believe I'm not or the story I tell myself is I'm not but maybe that's um, you know something is kind of revealed in that place so these two places that I inhabit I, fight, I feel great tension between them um, just a little personal story as a human rights worker with the ecumenical accompaniment program I once had to observe Palestinian labourers um, running the gauntlet through um, past Israeli soldiers, they call them border guards, as they were returning from labouring, working as labourers on building an Israeli settlement on Palestinian occupied land. This was uh, near Bethlehem. And the place is called Har Homa. And I was supposed to watch this um, and, in theory, reduce um, outbreak of, of violence or, a, you know, bad treatment by my presence. But what I witnessed was these labourers were being detained in a in a ditch, in a, a sort of concrete pipe, just for the amusement of the soldier who had the power and had the gun whilst he was there. And I got very, very angry about this at the time. And soon after, I fell ill with a, a rare gallbladder infection. So, um, yeah, I, I, I was really ill and hospitalized and left my service as an ecumenical company a, a couple of weeks early because of this experience. Um, so, so I feel kind of personally, you know, involved um, in this work. So let me move on to um, the background to the Reconciliation Laboratory. So it comes from an association with St. Stephen's Church, when which I started a year or so after I finished my stint as an advocate as an ecumenical accompanier. So I'd done a series of talks, including at St. Stephen's, and um, was thinking what next, and I saw the advert for 
uh, in the church notice board for a concerts organizer and I, I made inquiries and um, I I started to work and work alongside Canon Tim Higgins who had a whole theology about reconciliation and was um, marking the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade with an artist, uh, Grim Evelyn. And there were lots of workshops. So there was a bit of a budget to do something around reconciliation. And for two or three years together, we tried to run this thing called the Reconciliation Laboratory around topical controversial issues of the day. What A um, couple of which touched on Israel-Palestine. There was a book launch of a book called Crossing Columbia, written by um, an Israeli and a Palestinian author, Isra Jewish, Israeli and Palestinian author jointly um, exchanging recipes. These were two diplomats who'd met in Geneva. And the Jewish community came out in large numbers and a few Palestinian activists as well. And it was quite a productive um, meeting. Um, so there was a place to do it from. Um, and my experience of advocacy, I've been around talking a number of times, was that, yes, I can present a good case for ending occupation, but every time I presented a case for ending occupation, my sense was opposing arguments, opposing people were putting up counter arguments and digging their heels in, and that the very nature of advocacy creates opposition. So I thought there has to be something as well as advocacy, there has to be something beyond advocacy. Um, and I thought at the time of dialogue cafes where people sit in tables and listen to each other. Um, and Tim came up with the idea of a circle of people in front of a sacred space, uh, the reconciliation reredos at St. Stephen's. And then I reflected on my experience of, of Quaker meeting for worship, that, that, that the fundamental context is silence. Um, and all kinds of things go on mysteriously in that silence. Um, and then more particularly, there's the Quaker experience of worship sharing, where there is this understanding of Quaker silence as a context, as a spiritual context, and people share, and there's um, a kind of culture of not interrupting, of listening, of not judging, and of um, pondering and then sharing yourself. I'd been to a few of those sessions and experienced the quality of what that could be. I, I, I read also a bit about the Council of Elders. Um, it's sort of indigenous customs of um, solving disputes, not through um, individual patriarchal judges in particular places but by the wise people coming together and in a quakerly sort of way coming to um, a place of understanding about a, a wrongdoing a crime and their primary agenda is to repair harm from that crime so they'd be ad admitting of wrongdoing they'd be restitution um it's a form of restorative justice. And then I, at the time I was working a bit with um, uh, Marion Liebman, who of course is a well-known expert on restorative justice. So I found out a bit, about, a bit more about those processes. And uh, I'd also read some years before a book by Scott Peck called A Different Drum, which was the second book that he wrote. He, most famously, he wrote um, A Road Less Travel. But in A Different Drum, he talks about community building and that conflict is a necessary part of true community building. When you get beyond the superficial um, pseudo community, he calls it, when everyone's being nice to each other and polite, but under the surface, there are things happening you, you need to move to a place where conflict happens. Uh, and the thing is, conflict needs to happen in a creative way. And then I reflected that actually conflict is a necessary part of human interaction. But we need to have conflict well. We need to be able to own the conflict. Uh, we need to be able to own our story. 
and have this thing that Quakers have, which is a, a presumption that we may be wrong um, and a sense of discernment about how to move forwards. Um, so all these things came together in a kind of, uh, and I suppose fundamentally also, there's the example of of, um, of Jesus who faced with the might of the Roman system and the Jewish religious system at the time, um, kind of, it, it, you could say theologically, he substituted himself and his way uh, for the scapegoat uh, mechanism where someone else is is blamed, some other party is blamed and shoved out into the wilderness, which absolutely horrifically and graphically is what's is what's happening to Palestinians now. There's a kind of, you know, Jews will be safe in Israel if the Palestinians are killed, are, are cleared out, and that's being played out before our eyes uh, day in, day out. Um, so Jesus stands as as an opposing model of how to deal with tension, conflict, um, domination uh, through a nonviolent response to that to that scapegoatism and and the, the theology of it is that he becomes the Paschal Lamb. He takes that violence on himself without responding violently. He turns the other cheek, and that's not a. Um, a weak thing is actually an incredibly powerful thing because it exposes the violent system for its for its emptiness, and uh, he lives through to the end, um, to the point of resurrection in Christian theology. The example of coexistence, of mutual respect, of inclusion. Um, so that's so. These are the the backgrounds and the context for creating a res, um, reconciliation um, laboratory. The words come from the, that title comes from uh, Canon Tim Higgins. It was his idea to call it that. Reconciliation. It's clear, I think, to us what that means. Laboratory because it's an experiment. You never know quite what's going to happen. And as in all experiments, you learn from what happens and you observe what happens. And it's experiential. You have to go through it. You can't sort of do it somewhere else with, with other ingredients. We have to be the elements of the laboratory of the experiment. Um, so... Um, Slight pauses. I, I'm going to. What I'm going to do now is describe um, a, a reconciliation laboratory in the next five minutes or so, and then I'm going to I'm going to go back to where I can see you and um, take questions and and comments. Um, so, first thing about a reconciliation laboratory, it needs a lot of preparation. And I'm preparing for one on February the 12th. And the last few days, I've been sending out the invites. And then this is a, a period of fielding the invites, fielding the responses. I just noticed before clicking on that I've got a heartfelt response. I haven't digested it yet from um, an Israeli friend who lost um, friends and relatives in the Hamas attacks of October the 7th. Um, and already in there, there's an accusation or a mistrust of me, or we, we, I think we're good friends, but there's a mistrust that I haven't inquired enough into his feelings. Um, so, but at least the email goes on some length. So I think I can, re I hope I can repair things with him. Um, but this preparation phase is essential because it's about building trust. And the same thing with, with Palestinian friends who mistrust this process, who mistrust what I'm trying to do, who don't won't feel safe telling their story with people around them who are possibly hostile or indifferent or, or holding on to their version, their story. So that's the preparation phase is, is vital in any reconciliation laboratory. Going to 
going to the various parties, listening, being with them, building trust. Then we get to the circle. So it's a circle, it's like a Quaker meeting, a reconciliation laboratory. It can be any number of people. Um, in my experience, it's been sort of 10 to 20, 10 to 30 maximum. Um, the aim, um, there are first of all, there are group guidelines or group norms. Um, used to, we call these things ground rules, but rules is too harsh uh, a word really. So the aim is to listen actively and pay attention. We're all engaged and we're all responsible for that. Uh, we have to speak as I and avoid generalizations. Inevitably, people's opinions, positions, points of view will come across. But really, what, we, what we're getting towards is a story. What, what's my story? What's my authentic story? What's my lived experience? How have I come to feel as I feel around the Hamas attacks and the attack on Gaza. Um, we're aiming particularly for people who are as directly affected as possible, you know, people, for example, with relatives in, in Israel, Palestinians with relatives in Gaza. So speak as I. Um, speak if moved and not when not moved. This is the well-known injunction in Quaker ministry, we're supposed to not sort of jump up because a thought has come into our heads, but we're supposed to sit there until we really can't do anything else but speak. So you as Quakers will understand that. Um, confidentiality is important. Uh, um, so the grounds guideline will suggest it's all right to say what was said, but not to say who said it. Um, another important guideline, avoid a yes, but response. Someone may say something that really gets my goat and I really want to jump in there and say, uh, yes, that's all very well, but uh, that kind of response turns the thing into um, a discussion, a debate. Um, we need to, as in worship sharing, we need to be able to receive um, or afterward, sometimes that's a, quite a good example. We need, we need to be able to receive what is said without commenting on it directly. We, you know, our, our own story might be provoked, which is fine. So that's an essential part of the reconciliation laboratory. Another essential part is what the facilitator does. Um, so ensure group norms are understood and agreed. Um, that's a whole preliminary piece of work. We, we share the group norms, we ask people what they, what they understand by them, we have a discussion until it's established that everyone understands and everyone agrees. And if people don't agree, we see how we might change something until we come to a, an agreement. Um, facilitators hold the space and pay attention, rather like the work of elders in the meeting for worship. Um, facilitators invite engagement um i mean maybe things just flow and in which case the facilitator's job is easy but quite often it, it it doesn't flow and we invite engagement um perhaps we've we have someone we've already asked someone look can, can you tell your story early on because it'll stimulate other people um we remind people of the group guidelines and intervene that's a common role someone will go on maybe too long maybe they'll give their opinion too much and will remind them uh that that of the guidelines we might need to summarize what they've said to make sure it's been understood and that they feel heard that's really critical and especially facilitators need to hold back and not over intervene um and at, towards the end, we need to check into the sense of where do we go from here? Because it's unknown. It's all about the process and not about predicting an outcome, just like a, a meeting for worship. So uh, the last thing I want to say is, um, where, where, where's the spirituality of justice work over and against, or and the spirituality of conciliation work? Um, 
I'll just leave you with this thought. Uh, I, I describe my justice work as being passionate and emotional. It also, it's it's strategic and requ it's quite heady, you quite a lot of planning. Um, what do we, if demonstrations don't work, what do we do next, right? Direct action against Elbit, uh, Israeli arms suppliers. If that doesn't work, what do we do next? More dramatic action. And then quite soon you come to a line about nonviolence and violence and disruption. Um, and something in that paradigm is secular. It's about agency. It's about power, which is all very well. It's, it's nothing wrong with that. But I know that in my in my heart and head, I can leave out the mystery, the divine, the spirit. And in a reconciliation laboratory, the primary space is given to the unknown, is 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 is, is given to the, the, the Holy Spirit in my sort of Christian speak. Um, which is difficult because I have to let go of uh, control and the campaigning side of me is judgmental is saying you're being you're being uh, flaky uh, you're being woolly you're being middle of the road you're not committing um you're sitting on the fence making all these kind of judgmental uh, remarks and i have to sort of the part of me that uh, understands facilitation and reconciliation uh, and inclusion because i mean that's a whole that's a whole other thing I have to be able to love the uh, the British government that supports uh, Israel, for example. Somehow I have to love the people who were involved in that and obviously try and change their ways according to my perception. But hold the whole thing in, in, in a spirit of loving inclusion and allow space for the spirit to work, which is the fundamental thing we understand as Quakers in our meeting for worship. That's what we're doing in our silence. We're allowing space for the, the the composting, the, um, the 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 rising of the leaven, um, for it to happen, we're not in control, and and there's there's the tension. I want to be in control and use my power with others to to create change, and really, fundamentally, I'm I'm not I'm not in control. I'm not in control, um, and that's either going to lead me to utter impotence or or to a greater sense of of my spiritual uh, my true spiritual identity i guess and again that's interdependent and, and collective it's not about sort of me on my own in fact <laughs> the very you know the very essence of spirituality is it's it's union it's together Right, I've said enough. Um, I'm going to go back to the screen and you can say anything you like about anything I've said or, or something different. Uh, but thank you very much for being here and paying attention to what I'm trying to express. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, as a euphemism would now go, floor is open. Uh. Right, the uh, very simple question first would be to where uh, do you see this succeeding? And if so, do you have any views of where it would go from there? Um, success, we started to do um, uh, a risk assessment. Uh, and to think through the question of what the success looks like. But we haven't uh, met around that, so I only have some thoughts. Um, so as I said, it's process-centred and not outcome-centred. So 
it, it, it's you know I really don't know where it's going to go. But uh, success would be if people with a real stake in the situation, like my my friend, my Israeli friend, who's just written a, a passionate email to me, um, came right and tell and, and said his bit, um, and and that's there was someone else with a really different perspective, a really different life experience, life story, who said their bit. That just that would be would be success um at least you know a, a marker as to where it goes from here um i have hunches but i i don't know and i'm i'm open um i suspect there would be other i suspect if people have started to open up to each other and it's been uncomfortable and 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 sticky uh some might want to carry on i think a, a kind of one-off event is 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 amazing great but um you know how can we carry on in a sticky way with each other and build some kind of relationship even if we've got such different ex experiences um so carry our conflict forwards in, in further uh, i'm you know that's uh, and I, I also more more um definitely um from my point of view i want to research those sides within uh, palestine and in israel that are looking beyond what's happening now to uh, a, a coexistence based on mutual respect and there there are several albeit small groups that are doing this and i want to find out more about them and whether I can, you know, whether we can support them and how we can support them, but that's um, that's a personal thing. Where as to what happens out of this thing, I don't know. Well, I'd like to. I don't know if you say something. Very honestly. I I thank you, David. That was a very interesting, um, what would you call it, uh, opening of the dialogue on this issue. I mean, there are other organisations. I was talking to Valerie, you know, Russell Lima yesterday, yeah. Um, because we've got part of a group called uh women, uh, you know, interfaith women's group, and um, which includes Jew Jewish women and um. Uh, uh, Muslim women and um, also there's Together for Humanity which is beginning to open some sort of dialogue but I was thinking of your comment that you hope you're not anti-Semitic I mean I in, uh, knowing you as I have for quite a long time um, I wouldn't in any shape or form considering you anti-Semitic what you are is burning with desire for you know um the the values that you presented to us today for justice and for um common humanity on both sides which there are plenty of people in israel who feel as you do um but that with this i think the problem is um not the uh jewish people that you're feeling strongly about it's the or in the main but the um government and the right wing you know desire to as you so eloquently presented that Haaretz article today on Facebook about um, that the Israelis are trying to provoke an intifada in the West Bank you know by attacking the Palestinians in the West Bank you know to spread this conflict far from wanting to settle it but um, so so much most a lot of I know Jewish people who are taking part in the as I'm sure you do in the marches for Palestine because they want peace and you know a settlement of the um of the conflict there not but they don't minimize the horror of the attacks by Hamas on on uh, on the kibbutzes on the 9th of October that's you know, it's we, we, and Quakers in general, do, um, 
you know, see the justice on both sides. And that's where we are aiming for, isn't it? Um, some sort of reconciliation, exactly what you're saying about this reconciliation laboratory, that people come together and can talk, you know, to jaw jaw rather than war war. But I don't think that the current government in Israel is at all remotely interested in jaw jaw. You know, they, as you've, we've heard, um, you know, Netanyahu saying to Biden, more or less, you know, we're going to disregard you completely. Anyway, I, I don't think you should have any concerns about being anti-Semitic. And I, but having said that, I can see why you might feel that, because we've got the Holocaust Memorial Service, um, you know, commemoration, civic commemoration coming up on Friday, next Friday, the 26th at the City Hall or whatever it's called now, um, in the morning. And half our committee discussions are about security, you know, because people are good. There are people that may see having a commemoration of the horror of not just the Holocaust, but all genocides, which is what the day is about now, um, you know, could be seen as being um, uh, um, supporting Israel against Palestine sort of things. Things are becoming so polarized. We need more reconciliation laboratories and together for humanities. Thank you for, you know, everything you've said. Thank you, Claire. This is the first time in over in three years that we have had <laughs> such a quiet time after the speaker. So, David, you have you have produced us to thought and silent contemplation, which in itself is a good thing, but. I would try and encourage people to 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 speak as Hattie has a hand up. So we will go straight away to Hattie. Um, yeah, this I, I was challenged the other day by a friend. Can you really see the good in the government? And um, <clears throat> trying to discuss that aspect of. Um, meeting and sort of arguing um, and getting your points across to people who are actually not listening and don't look like they're going to do anything about it. But can you really hold them in the light and really recognise that they have something somewhere inside of them which is good? And um, it's a very difficult jump, a leap of faith and trust to make. And you might well have to find out about somebody in quite some depth to find out if you can genuinely believe that they have some good inside of them. Yeah. Thank you for talking about that bit, David. Yeah, David, thank you so much for uh, all you've said. <clears throat> um, and I also thank you for your vulnerability, because that's so important in, in this kind of process. Um, I'm immediately taken back to my experiences of living and working in Northern Ireland and at the Corrymeela Peace and Reconciliation Centre. And I know that um, reconciliation is a very long process uh, and a very uh, necessary one. So any efforts to help uh, people from opposing sides meet with each other, learn about each other and gain understanding 
is hugely important to any uh, opportunity for moving forward and and for peace. And I was reminded um, there was a retired theologian and philosopher called Rule Kaptam, who's also a psychoanalyst, who did some work with the Karimila community. And an expression he used uh, stuck with me all my life, out of chaos comes endless possibilities of new beginnings. So when everything is tossed in the air, um, we know we've got to do something. And you know what you're talking about and the laboratory is a is a beginning. And I really hope I can get there and be part of it. But again, thank you for taking this step. Thank you very much. Mm. We, you, you, I, I don't think you've forced us into silence, David. I think we're being reflective about this. Uh, and there's, there's a, a question about how much we can accomplish and how. And um, I mean, you, you, you know a little of my background. I, I learned to meditate years ago. And part of the platform when I heard about it was that meditation could create peace, bring about peace, which is something I'm sure that um, uh, Quakers can resonate with. And uh, a few years later, I found myself volunteering to go to a trouble spot and was flew with a group to Damascus uh, at the time that there was a civil war in the Lebanon. And quite a few groups assembled in the region and within a few weeks there was peace and there was uh, the, the shooting the violence stopped in lebanon and um and an arab peace summit was convened uh we're quite impressed with <laughs> we hadn't expected that kind of result uh, a few weeks later i sort of i thought wow that's this is incredible and a few weeks later i was in iran and at the time, there was um, this was before Khomeini had arrived back. In fact, I, I was in Iran at the time the Shah left the country, but without a great deal of bloodshed. Um, and there was a meditation group there, and we were wondering if we were having an effect. And um, um, <laughs> one day there was a riot uh, in the town I was in, Isfahan. And a quarter of a million local people assembled and they burnt down the secret police headquarters. And naturally the military came on the radio and said, the television said, this is not good. Um, we gave you a little bit of freedom and you have behaved badly and, and you're planning a strike and this must not happen. And the next day the military came round and people came out of a building opposite where my meditation group was staying, pointed at our building and the military started shouting and we didn't know what to do. Um, but we didn't have to decide. They shot the lock off the apartment building uh, with quite a lot of um, automatic rifle fire and came in and searched the building and pull, pulled our group into a room and took two of us off to military headquarters because we had cameras and they thought we were spies or something. So we, we, we had limited agency. And um, the upshot was, you know, the, the next day there was a group phone call of all the different groups in different cities in Iran with Maharishi. Um, and we were all thinking, you know, the, the master is going to say something and make it all right. And the, the, we all gave our news. And then there was a sort of silence and you're waiting for it. And Maharishi said, it is a very big mess. <laughs> and he went, ah, you know, it's sort of like, oh, oh no. And he 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 said it just needed a bigger group and that we had limited resources. And um, if the Shah would pay for a bigger group, then we'd do what we can. But if he wouldn't, we had to leave and we should make sure we all left together. And 
a whole bunch of us left within a couple of weeks flying out of the country um, through the airport. And it was like the fall of Saigon. And to me, this is a little bit like the way the world is at the moment. It's a very big mess. Um, and the ray of hope that I can think, I'm, I'm this evening oh. be joining a group meditation in Bristol with some people who are just back from a meditation group with 11,000 people meditating together in Hyderabad for two weeks. Um, and th th there's some indication that the violence was less during that time that 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 and you know i i i i later experienced being in america at the time that gorbachev dismantled communism but that was a big meditation group for a long time and so i just wanted to introduce that idea that there, there may be there may be a way that collectively we can acquire agency and do something and meantime the more that we do to think on these things and what we can do I think it's very valuable to have workshops like this, but I um, just thought, you know, put in this little piece that there, there, there may be a technology of peace that could produce a shift in world consciousness. Thanks, David. Roger, you put your hand up. Yeah. You're uh, muted, Roger. Sorry, Roger, I muted you earlier. Yeah, the, a few noises about there we are um i, I wonder whether whether david Mart had, had a, a response to make to, to david before i speak uh no i just accept it i i i, I, I hear it <laughs> um maybe yeah maybe, maybe david you're you're absolutely right i think my only response is both and you know i i think um let's just carry on being being quakers and do what we do well i think we could i think one reflection is i i do wonder so my main experience is is meeting for worship in central and if that's it is i wonder if how deep uh, how pure how um focused is our experience of worship is is what is, is what we're doing. You know, we 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 we're loyal, we're loving, um, we're committed. How? What is the relationship between what we do and what Maharishi and transcendental meditation is? That's a whole other thing. Um, but at least there, is, insofar as there's overlap, the quality, the and therefore the 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 resonance beyond our our room of what it is we're doing is important. That's a, that's a question. So what David's saying leads me with that, that question. But uh, so, and, and, and parking that aside, then, then carry on with the reconciliation laboratory, which of course has some of those elements. I mean, in that space, when you're listening to people and you're not judging, I mean, of course there's, there's going to be commentary, but you're not, addressing them through the filter of your commentary as you hear a story you you're you're living inhabiting a bigger space a more mysterious space than the commentary that goes on in your head hearing someone um and that's i think david has things to say david saunders has things to say and practice around that so yeah there's a there's overlap Oh, thank you very much, both Davids, um, uh, particularly David Mart, of course, for a wonderful introduction to the issues. Um, and I'm very grateful. I've struggled all my life, I think. I, I, I'm old enough to have... Um, my early childhood was experience was in, uh, during the Second World War. And I've always struggled right through my life with the... Um, disconnect between my own pacifist convictions, um, my belief in reconciliation, and, and the power of love, on the one hand, and 
what I rather oversimplifying called practical politics on the other. Um, and it, and of course that's come up again in the in the Gaza situation, and it's come up again in the in the Ukraine war. I mean, the basic question is: while I would myself be unwilling to take part in in violent action, and I'm, a, I'm a, actually I'm a registered conscience subjector. I'm old enough to have gone through a tribunal and been given conditional exemption. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think uh, the the rational bit of me, the uh, the the practical politics bit of me he says, what choice had we in 1939 but to go to war? Mm. And uh, uh, likewise, what choice? What well, one can recognize all all the background uh, problems of the the reason why Russia has has invo- invaded Ukraine, uh, and very in in many ways very understandable reasons. And yet, uh, how can I? Criticize the Ukrainians for, for standing up for their freedom, and and if I do, then what practical steps do I take, or what attitude do I take to the to the way in which my country has recognized that obligation to 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 support support Ukraine? Um, so uh, I, I think all I'm doing is exposing a big big dilemma and a big problem uh, that I. Have, as I say, struggled with all my life, really, um, considering how or what one's attitude is to uh, people who seek to resolve their different differences by physical violent means, and my belief that that's wrong. Um, I mean, it, it it hit me over over Gaza over the question of. Whether whether we called for a pause for humanitarian uh, relief or do we call for a ceasefire? Well, I want both. Um, uh, <laughs> but I, I couldn't see a ceasefire happening in practical terms, and therefore I supported the clause for for uh, um, humanitarian pauses. I I think my position has changed. I I, I can see that. A great, a great, as great a possible drive to to uh, to a ceasefire is, is probably the um, is is the right the right way in practical terms as well as in moral terms. But it, there we are. I presented a, a problem of mine, and um, no doubt other people will share it one way or another. Thank you, Roger. I am very simple in that look, and uh, think of myself as a bit of a simple man, really, in a lot of cases. And my <laughs> views on that is, if you want things to change, and if you are serious in your role of being a religious person, stop killing people. That can only be that, that you can only get these requisition, requisition, and all things that go along with that by by having peace within your heart, with having no having not having the desire for revenge for. Um, it, in that sense, you know, it it seems to me a, a simple thing, but I understand that it is very conflict. And having dealt most of my professional life with uh, parents and children who are in conflict a lot of the time. I understand that there is a need to speak, but there is a need to hold other people's views 
but sometimes it saddens me that we are still affected by this tribalism which seems to break out every every few years it seems now with no learning being done in the past thanks Ray Just um, in the silence, uh, and, and in response to your both and, David, um, during this assembly in uh, Hyderabad in India, um, a lot of Indian luminaries, spiritual luminaries and scientists were invited. And so when people went meditating, there were sessions on, on the technology of meditation and uh, some recognition that Maharishi had revived ancient practices uh, that can be tested scientifically. So I, you know, one might be, most, most people who've heard of meditation think, oh yes, it's this, or yes, it's that. But yoga is actually a very precise science and um, precise techniques were dug up by Maharishi and tested and experimented with. And it's interesting that um, people in India were coming together to discuss their their own tradition. And uh, quite a few movements were saying, oh, we'll, we'll send some of our people to learn your technique and to practice with you. And there's, there's one billionaire there who said, well, I'll, I'll fund a group. So <laughs> there's some hope that India may may um, come together in the next who knows what time uh, and and run a prolonged experiment. And, um, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if that works and that we've got something that we can incorporate in our discussions and learnings. Dialogue. And I very much recommend I, for quite some time, I was a member of community building in Britain, uh, working around the works of Scott Peck and uh, his idea for community in the different drum. And I, I found that to be a very powerful way of having well facilitated dialogues in a group that surfaced issues and helped people, as you say, shift from position of pseudo community through uh, conflict or chaos and into uh, silent spaces that then become a, a deep sense of community. Thanks. Okay, good Are there any more comments and questions for David? Claire. Um, I was very taken with um was it Rosalind's um quotation about out of chaos come endless possibilities of new beginnings? Because I've been feeling very very downhearted recently about this whole well, a lot of things as um you know, Roger mentioned Ukraine as well. Um, and then there's the Sudan. I mean, there's chaos all over the place. And how chaos, it must, it is total chaos in Gaza for the people there. And it's all flattened. And, and I was thinking also of the universe, the beginning of the universe, when everything was chaos for billions of years. Well, it's still happening, isn't it? Re life and new birth and so forth. Um, but it made me feel hopeful that out of this chaos and horror, 
maybe a whole new order of things will arise. So that that's raised my spirits. Thank you all, and especially David. Hiya. Hello, how are you? Um, I am thinking of the school peace project that Marion and other people are involved in. And I think it's such a wonderful thing that um, children should practice resolution of conflict and actually experience it. So I just was thinking about that, really. something we should support, I think, take an interest in. <clears throat> I think... <laughs> We have now come to, uh, what are we? Oh, we've gone 12. Uh, any more comments, friends? I wonder if you haven't uh, some kind of closing word for us, David, how you feel from this session and uh, what reflections you've been having as we've discussed this. Um. Well, I'd like to thank you, David, for that invitation. Uh, I'd just like to start with the practical thing that this reconciliation laboratory will, will be in area news um, and it will be on Monday evening, the 12th of February. Uh, there might be others, but we don't we don't yet know. Um, and that's seven o'clock till nine o'clock in the cafe space at St. Stephen's. And if if you come... I'm, I'm asking Quakers if they come, feel moved to come, to help in the task of holding the space, uh, but not necessarily contribute, uh, you know, their own ministry, as it were, their own uh, life story. But holding the space could be good, bearing in mind that it's not a huge space and we think it's got room for about 30 people. So if you can bear with the organizers if you put your names forward there's a reply it's not a reply slip you just reply to the email um and just say your interest and we'll we'll hold you but i think yeah there's there'd be great value in having people there to hold the space it could there might be for example someone who gets very distressed who says their bit gets very distressed and then someone to sit next to them um or they might they might have to leave the room go to the loo just go to another space and someone to be with them if they haven't brought a friend i'm i'm you know i'm imagining what might happen but quakers there can be trusted to do the right thing um listen i thank you very much for for listening and hearing me out and for the ways Yeah, I don't know. As a culture, you have a Quakers. We you have a way. We have a way of um, just accepting what's said and reflecting on it, and with, with humility. And that's a lovely quality. It it's it's encouraging for me to be heard because as I uh, prepare for it, I can feel a bit on my own, like I'm doing something that's a bit ridiculous. It certainly doesn't sit easy with the, the whole side of me that's and the, the people that are doing all the justice stuff um, or the campaigning. It doesn't sit easy. And I, I've got... So to, to, to feel held and heard by you lot is great. Thank you very much. And... The invitation... Where are they? Uh, it's in area. I've sent. 
I've sent a copy to every clerk um, and have sent it to area news. AM news. Thank you. So Heather will publish it in about a week or 10 days. We come to an interesting bit now to Patsy and I, because um, I think the case still is that we are we are vacant next week, are we not, Patsy? I didn't hear what you said, Ray. I'm awfully sorry. Are, no. are, are we are we vacant next week? Oh no, 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 no. We, we we're lucky enough to have. Um, uh, uh, I think it's um, just a moment. I've written it down. Um, he's he's present today, Gordon. Um, um, and Gordon is is going to. Sorry, Gordon. My writing is all scribbled here. I, I I've got it. Tell me if this is correct. A long journey into the sound of silence. Is that right? Oh, you're you're, you're muted. Gordon, you're oh. wonderfully silent. You're demonstrating the point. Gordon, yes, you're muted. Where? That's yeah, better. good for our lip reading skills. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I need the lip reading. I I can't hear very well. Um, but yes, it's um, it sounds more elaborate than it really is. But I've been interested in this for a long time, um, and it can, could come from several directions. But uh, the, the thing that intrigued me for a long time has been the, the whole business of increasing sense of loneliness and isolation we have in the world. And part of it is due to the way, I suppose, our consciousness has developed through the ages. So I start with face-to-face, voice-to-voice, to what we've got at the end, sound of silence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That, uh, that is a surprise to me, at least, but I am glad we are sorted. So, dear friends, we come to the end of today. And thank you, David, again for your interesting uh, view, talks on this subject. And we go, we, we go now and have lunch and do other things. But as my usual statement goes, Tell everybody about these talks. Tell your friends. Even tell your cat if you want. But yeah. remember, we are here next Friday. So, good day to you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you.